Hello and welcome to the Gospel of Mark. Today as we begin our ninth week of commentary on this beautiful Gospel, we have something very special for you. Besides our usual guest, Dr. Robert Maldonado, who is a professor at Fresno State University and a really expert in the Gospel of Mark, we have across from me a priest coming to us from the Archdiocese of Sao Paulo, Father José Marins. Father Marins was an expert at the Vatican Council and for the second, third, and fourth sessions of that council was there with the bishops from Brazil helping them to create what was for us the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Since then, Father Marins has been working for these 50 years in ministry all over the Catholic world, sharing the methodology of Comunidades de Base, which is basic Christian communities. Father Jose, we're so glad you're joining us today. Before we begin the commentary on Mark, could you give us just a little bit of an idea of why you're here visiting us in the diocese this week? Okay, I am a member of an uh, itinerant missionary pastoral team um, from Brazil, but serving the church uh, in the world, the ones they call us to go. And uh, have this year the possibility to work in the United States. We start in the area of uh, Miami with the Portuguese community or Brazilian community, in Reno, Nevada, with the Spanish speaking people. And uh, here in the California, in Soledad, and uh, now in Fresno. And uh, the, as you mentioned, it, uh, the, the our goal and our task is to help people to develop small Christian communities and evaluate their perspective of the church according to the Vatican II and the early churches. That's it. Thank you very much, Father Jose, who will be with us this week and next week to help us um, understand how these Gospels could be working for our Christian communities as they did back in the day 2,000 years ago. Robert, could you begin by maybe breaking open those first six verses of uh, chapter 3 of Mark? Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And they watched him to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out, and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. This turns out to be the fifth of the five conflict stories that we've been looking at this early part of Mark. Robert, I wonder if there's one part that you know we do need to focus in on right away, and then we'll see with Father Jose where he would see a, a Christian community working with the text. Well, I think it's good to just repeat some of the material from the last episode uh, in terms of remember that these are constructs of the Markan community. Uh, The accusations that the Pharisees are said to bring against Jesus uh, are uh, a little extreme. Uh, Within Jewish tradition in the period, there was lots of discussion about what was permissible on the Sabbath and what wasn't. Uh, And so uh, Jesus' activity here certainly falls within that uh, That range. Uh, I think there's a couple things that are quite interesting about this. Uh, One is kind of signaling something that's going to happen later in in Mark, and that's that the man has a withered hand. And withered shows up in in the gospel in various places, but importantly, uh, in the next chapter, where the seed is on the rocky (laughs) ground and the sun rises and and it withers. Uh, It also occurs uh, with the hemorrhaging woman's uh, blood. Uh, withering and stopping to flow. Uh, The uh, epileptic boy in the synagogue in chapter 9 withers, which seems to be stiffens. Uh, And then finally, the cursing of the fig tree in uh, in chapter 11 uh, with the fig withering. Uh, And and so what's interesting about the withering here is that his hand is unable to do what it needs to do. So in, in some respects, it's like the paralytic uh, who was, uh, who was 
uh, let down through the roof uh, in the last chapter. Uh, Jesus gives him an instruction so that he has to do something too. He has to stretch out his hand uh, and, and it's, it's made whole. The other thing that doesn't show up in the, in, the, in the English text so much is that when Jesus says, come here, it, says he, it literally says, come to the middle. And so in a, in a kind of dramatic way, Jesus is moving, moving this man uh, from the margin to the center. And so what was a sort of marginalization, a disenfranchisement of the man with the withered hand uh, becomes a sort of a return to the center of the, of the community in the synagogue. You know, what, what I really found most interesting with what Robert just said is the use of withering in many other uh, texts that we're going to be seeing later and to know that this is obviously a theme. Father Jose, is there something that you immediately want to comment on and how does a Christian community work with a text like this? Yes, as you mentioned before, we take more the perspective of the social ecclesial perspective from the text <clears throat> to our context. Well, the healing, what does it mean meant for Jesus, for the Pharisee and for the sick person, meant a different thing. And uh, what is at stake from the perspective we take is life. Ultimately, the reign of God is at stake in the Jesus mission because the meaning of being sick and the changing that it's more than a very particular disease it's a perspective of a human being and the human society and the reign of God. The next verse that we want to look at maybe would be to jump, if we could, to verse 7 through 12, see if that adds any light, and also wonder if it also has more that we'll come back to regarding our withered hand and that image. So Robert, if we could see that second part of the passage we need to read, could you share that with us? This is verses 7 through 12. Uh, Jesus withdrew with the disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, also from Judea, and Jerusalem, and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, hearing all that he did, came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they should crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed upon him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits beheld him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. We jumped right to the next passage, leaving material still to be covered on the first part, I'm sure. Now that we've got the first 12 verses on the table, is there anything that you'd like to um, make a connection between those two different passages or to get back to the withered, the withered hand or to add something from the part we just read right now? Well, both. I will underline three things. First, the law is not to be a plus. It should be a plus, a help, not a hindrance. And uh, in this moment... In some way, Jesus is showing to these uh, Pharisees and others that perhaps is the phrase of Gamaliel, be careful not finding you fighting against God. Because it's not just one thing, it's the side of God. God is taking side with the poor people, the suffering, the downtrodden, the no ones. And uh, in healing, Jesus is showing the the side of God. God do not want this. God wants to change this. And uh, it's important how we see this connected with our mission today. And I will comment it later. Robert, where do you see um, these 12 verses clarifying other concepts in Mark's gospel that we need to make clear to ourselves. Well, uh, again, one of the interesting things in the first part of the passage in, in chapter 3 is that Jesus asks a direct question uh, for the second or third time. Uh, it's it's uh, third 
technically, but the second one is simply, have you not read back in the plucking grain of the Sabbath, uh, on the Sabbath? But here, Jesus is directly asking them a question that, that sort of requires a question, uh, an answer. It's not just, it's not just rec- rhetorical. And what Mark tells us after he asks the question, is it lawful to do good or harm on the Sabbath, uh, their response is to be silent. And, and again, I would encourage the viewers to sort of, as we get through Mark, to pay attention to, you know, who speaks, who doesn't speak. Uh, the, the voices in this gospel are actually quite interesting. Uh, Mark actually has the most words. Uh, the narrator's words are more than half of the gospel. Uh, and Jesus only has uh, about a third uh, to uh, a little bit less. And all the other characters combined have the remaining small portion. Uh, so silence and voice, you know, Jesus elicits voice from characters. Sometimes they respond positively. In this case, they respond negatively. And so the next passage contrasts the crowd who has responded positively, almost dangerously, because now Jesus is sort of threatened by the, by the crowd. But at least they're doing the more, I think, from the Markan perspective, proper thing of, of coming to Jesus and, and not simply refusing to respond uh, to his, his inquiries. Just a very brief comment. Uh, when we look uh, to the social and the ecclesiastical perspective, we look at the silent people, and they are very dangerous because they are not taking sides, or they already had sides, their side. And when they mention it, it's becoming very difficult. It's uh, when we dialogue, it's possible to help each other. When we are silent, it's dangerous. There's a part at the um, end of this passage that we just looked at, 11 and 12, where it says, you are the son of God. And once again, we have the unclean spirits declaring Jesus, even though the disciples won't. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Do we want to clarify for people again what that son of God may mean and why it is that perhaps Jesus is making it clear he doesn't need this um, known right now. Well, again, it's, it's, it's curious for, for the hearers of the gospel because remember, Mark starts this gospel with little preparation and Jesus starts doing things, uh, <coughs> saying things that are, in some respects, quite puzzling. And, and even the disciples finally in chapter 4 will sort of vocalize the question, who is this man that even the sun and the, I mean, the sea and the wind obey him uh, in the stilling of the storm story? And so certainly when characters in the, in the story ask the question, that it, it cannot help but being a question for the reader. And so Mark is leading us to uh, sort of unfold things. And so uh, one of the things that happens in the gospel is that people should respond, as I was saying earlier, in certain uh, moments, uh, but demons are silenced uh, consistently, and and with a word that is, with a very few important exceptions, uh, ep- the Greek word is epitomao, it's a word that Mark almost always uses only in demonic exorcism kinds of contexts, as I say, with some exceptions that we'll see later in the gospel. And so demonic voices, even when they're correct, uh, are silenced, uh, but human voices are supposed to be interactive and not silenced. And so that, I think, as, as Father Jose was saying, uh, you know, the social aspect of who gets silenced and what are our own institutions that silence people, you know, racism, sexism, uh, we, we take the voices from people regularly, uh, as did the Romans, as did m- most institutions. Um, we have to take our break right now, but Please just come back with your Bible and an open heart because we're going to be breaking open some more of Mark in the next half of the program. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome again to the Gospel of Mark. Father Jose, I think you had something to add just before we took the break, before we look at the next passage. Yes, the Gospel said that the great multitude followed Jesus. And today we have the impression that the multitude of the living, the church, 
and perhaps leaving Jesus. But this is not true. People are still hungry and thirsty. But what are they, in the first impression, what are they looking for? And the church sometimes tends to be uh, a kind of circles or uh, offering something in a consumeristic style. But what people are able to, uh, are trying to find, perhaps in the first moment, they do not are able to identify what they are looking for. And it's up to us to discover what are the thirst and the hunger people have today. And perhaps the way we are answering to it is a wrong way because uh, it's deeper, the process. What is the perspective of God for the world? God is not menacing the world. God is helping us, but helping from a different side, the side of the smallest people. In Africa, they said that small people doing irrelevant things in a small town will make big changes. And we believe in it. So we need it in the church to give time to the ordinary people, not only to the leaders. The leaders, certainly, we need to work with the leaders. But don't never forget the common people. Because the spirit is also working there. And we need to identify the code of the spirit. Otherwise, we are not able to answer to their thirst and uh, hunger. Thank you, Father. And Robert, uh, just to follow up on that as well, uh, I'm pretty sure in this passage, the word for multitude there is, is only here and then later in verse 8. And, and everywhere else, it's a different word. And la, uh, one of the previous episodes, I mentioned how the crowd is one of the positive symbols. But this, this crowd seems to be a little dangerous. And it's really interesting, given what Father Jose just said, uh, because the very next thing, as we're going to see, is the appointing of the disciples. And, and, and so this multitude, which may have been suppressed, pushed to the margin, uh, is now reacting in a way that is positive but also dangerous and so it actually kind of pulls the two institutions together in terms of the leadership uh, who hopefully will respond properly uh, to both protect Jesus and uh, as and and also serve the serve the crowd the multitude in this case so perfect that the reading that Robert will read now which names off that first um, uh, list of apostles is going to be followed up with, I think, what Father Jose was saying. The church needs to examine, we need to examine just how we are ministering to the hungers and thirsts of the world today. Just as Jesus wondered, are these guys getting it? Robert. And he went up to the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve to be with him and to be sent out to preach and to have authority to cast out demons. Simon, whom he surnamed Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, whom he surnamed Boanerges, uh, that is, sons of thunder, uh, Andrew and <coughs> Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Robert, where would you want to just make the first start here? And then I'm sure Father Jose is going to help us see where this plays out in our daily Christian lives. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually puzzled by this episode uh, personally, and I haven't quite uh, decided how to think about it. I'm not quite sure what to think about the mountain, uh, that, that they go up, away. Uh, these are the ones that Jesus desires. Uh, the disciples come to him. Uh, but again, the disciples turn out to be such a negative character in, in Mark uh, that it's, it's hard to exactly know what we're supposed to think about this because obviously on the face of it, it seems like it would be positive. Uh, these are the people that, that Jesus is appointing. Uh, but as the gospel uh, moves along, they turn out to be negative examples. Um, 
maybe I should say one more thing about that in terms of the narrative criticism that we've talked about previously. It's not that these are direct depictions of the disciples, but that Mark is using them to using them as characters. Uh, Matthew uh, characterizes the disciples, for example, quite differently and, and more traditionally, at least in terms of the popular notions of the disciples, whereas Mark, uh, they are simply the negative example not to be like. Um. Well, just a, <clears throat> from the pastoral perspective, when we reflect about this text, we are very careful to uh, examine if uh, we are uh, kidnapping Jesus from the people, and uh, n- we know that God sent Jesus for the whole humanity, not only for the Catholic Church. And so we are supposed to be mediators, and sometimes we keep Jesus for us. And uh, our mission finish in the sacristy, and not in the world. And uh, we need to understand that the people who Jesus invited, first of all, was to be with him. And the people having experience of God. In Japan, they ask for the, a friend, a missionary there. Well, you send good missionaries here, but is any possibility that you send people who have experience of God? Because we have some experience of God here, <laughs> and we wanted to share. Because you do not have the monopoly of God. It's for everybody, and you, we gave it. So this kind of people are servants, not owners of God. And we'll comment on other points later. There's a certain group of words here that I, I wonder if Robert can start commenting and then Father Jose to pick up. It seems like... Jesus, who has had authority over demons, is suddenly, and preaching, is suddenly giving, in this context, somehow appointing, as Aaron and Moses were appointed, he's sending these people out to preach with authority and to cast out demons. How important is it that Mark, already in chapter 3, or is he anticipating what he's going to really do better later in chapter 6, when it's more appropriate that they're sent out? Well, there's a couple things. I mean, when Jesus comes out, he comes out only to preach uh, and, and not to cast out demons. And so the casting out demons, he starts doing right away <laughs> or very, very quickly. And so that seems to be a kind of augmentation of his ministry. And then it's now being passed on to the, uh, to the disciples. And, and I think, again, that's important because uh, the back on the voice issue, the demonic voices need to be silenced uh, and, and the preaching can't happen if, if other voices are uh, sort of in, getting in the way and keeping God's voice, uh, the voice uh, to the poor, uh, as uh, central. Father Jose, is there anything in these first 19 verses, now we can wrap up maybe this half of the gospel, any um, thoughts that you know you'd like to share before we, um, we do have to say that's the end of the show? Well, I want to underline the second point. The first was to be with Jesus. The second was to share good news, not bad news. And so the task of the church is not to terrorize people, but to show God is merciful. And it is, it, to be a Samaritan church that is able to to be in, on the side of the people in order to help them to connect God. And the presence of evil is not a presence of a spirit. It's the, 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 the seeds that we, perhaps we are a demon, the, um, difficulty for the others. And how church is demon for others? Because we are putting obstacles for people and in irrelevant things. And we should concentrate on what is very essential and discover and to give a priority to it and not to just implement the structure when the structure is not anymore being um, a help for the people. The structure is not a goal, it's a mediation, a historical mediation, as the church is a historical mediation. So the 
uh, ultimate perspective is the reign of God, and the, according to it, we needed to make a change and adaptation and uh, born constantly a new way. Now, obviously, I'm seeing what Father Jose is saying, talking to me about the contemporary situation of the church. I'm seeing it very clearly and very prophetically. Robert, I'm wondering if in the text of Mark up to this point, up to 319, Mark is himself in any way giving certain warning, giving certain um, preaching that is in the line of what Father Jose is saying, a certain warning to the community about its role, its mission, its identity, its message. Well, I think, uh, I think yes. I think Mark is starting to signal that uh, in, the, in the narrative that there is some conflict, uh, not just with John the Baptist followers, but with other Christian churches. And uh, I believe that the disciples actually are somewhat symbolic of some churches down the street that Mark is in, as I think of them, <laughs> down, the, down the path, uh, that Mark's community is in some competition with. And, uh, and, and, and so Mark is trying to articulate a vision for uh, the followers of, in Mark's community uh, to, that, that there are others who say uh, the church should do X, Y, and Z. And it does seem to be a bit more triumphalistic version of Christianity that Mark is in competition with. And, and so uh, Mark is rejecting the sort of imperial uh, modes and, and trying to establish uh, the, to the base communities, the, the alternative church. What a beautiful um, conversation we've had with a special guest today, Father Jose Marins. Father Jose will be back next week with us as we look at the concluding verses of chapter 3. What's really important is to see that in our commentary around the scripture as it was written, we're seeing it has an eternal relevance. And what was the gift, I think, of Father Marins today is to show us that after Vatican Council II, something he has been committed to for 50 years, we're seeing the need for the church to address issues such as what Mark is giving us in the text, but text that is a living, concrete call to us to follow Jesus according to Mark. Till next week, God bless.